kids are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad <laughs> Welcome to another exciting episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. How are we all doing today, everyone? And let me tell you, after last week's episode, I definitely had quite a blast. And by the way, uh, one thing that I want to ask the chat wall already, um, how did you guys feel about last week's episode? I know it was something that was absolutely different, and I did skip out on many of the news that happened last week, but how did you guys uh, feel about last week's episode? Did you have a good time with it? I, I just want to know. I uh, just want to see uh, some of the response from uh, last week. Yeah, okay, people are saying it's good, good, yep, yep, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, wow. So it's already getting, uh, pretty well received. That is great to see, actually. Uh, for me, honestly, I felt like last week was such a wonderful time. I definitely had a blast with it. And, you know, maybe in the future, I'm not saying that this will happen all the time, but, you know, it, it pretty much uh, conquered my fear of trying something new and trying something different with my podcast. It was definitely a fun episode to do, and I'll see if in the future, if it ever if it ever so happens that there might be something different that I could try out to spice up Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, then maybe I'll consider trying it out, you know? Give, give the podcast some uh, new and fun surprises, who knows? Uh, but anyways, um, with that said though, uh, now that we have managed to do that episode in particular, it is now time that we shall go and put things back to normal in terms of the, uh, podcast though. Uh, yes, we, we had fun in the past, but now it's gonna be time that we shall go, oh, hold on a sec, I just realized that, um, uh, sorry, I just realized on my screen, oh no. Uh, maybe it's something I could fix up a little bit later. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, everything seems to be fine. I don't know. I, I was just double checking on my end in terms of what's happening on the screen. But yes, we are going to be going back to normal. And on this episode, we are going to be back talking about many of the animation news that did occur this week. And trust me, there are definitely going to be some things that we will be talking about. And a lot of things that are worth talking about on this episode. So with that said and done, I would like to go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, are you ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it, people. Are, are you all set for this? Uh, let's see now. Do we have... Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. Some people are ready. People are anticipating for this moment. That's good. All right. Yep. That is great. That's nice to see. And I believe with all that said... It is now time that we shall go and get things started. And with the first story that I have for you this week, we're going to talk about one company that seemed to be really popping up a lot in terms of the entertainment news. And I'm talking, of course, about Sony Pictures. Because lately, more so than any other week, for some reason, this really was the week where Sony decided to go and unleash a whole bunch of different news. And a whole bunch of news that would have been worth talking about on this podcast, actually. There was at one point, Sony announced that they're going to open their first ever water park called uh, Columbia Pictures Aquaverse that's going to be opening in Thailand and actually opening pretty soon in October, uh, which by the way, just want to let you know that apparently with that theme park, they're not going to go and like build an entire Sony Pictures water park. What they are going to do is that they're going to take an already existing water park and they're just going to slap in a whole bunch of different Sony Pictures properties. You know, they're going to slap in the faces of Will Smith, Slimer, Dracula, and all those different characters all across uh, that already existing theme park. Think of uh, think of uh, what Pixar Pier did with, in Disney California Adventure, where they took an already existing uh, area and they're just slapping on the face of different cartoon characters. That's the same thing that they're going to do uh, with the Aquaverse. And the fact that it's going to be opening up in October is such a serious risk though 
Like, it is insane the fact that they would even consider opening up a theme park uh, or a water park, especially this year. I know that we are at the point where uh, mass vaccinations are happening, but still, with this pandemic, the future is still very unpredictable. So you never know what's going to happen in the future. And this is a serious risk. This could either very go, this could go very well for both Sony and for Thailand, or this could end up going massive terribly like I, I don't know I could just imagine the two extremes are the most likely scenarios that could happen with that theme park but then uh, there is also another announcement that did happen regarding the fourth Hotel Transylvania film, where not only is it going to be released a little bit earlier than planned, instead of the beginning of August, I believe they scheduled it for July 23rd, but they also gave it a brand new title called Hotel, Trans uh, Hotel Transylvania Transformania, which they also stated that it's going to be the final installment of the Hotel Transylvania franchise, which I could say, thank God, so now now, Sony can finally move on and actually get back to making more original features, more new films, and hopefully more better films, because lately their stuff has been a lot more uh, a lot more promising, uh, especially with that trailer that they had recently with The Mitchells vs. The Machines that's, that's uh, coming soon on Netflix. That, that is actually the best trailer that I've seen and the best representation of The Mitchells vs. The Machines, so I am, optimistically, I, I am optimistically curious to see how that goes. And also, by the way, just one thing that I want to quickly mention regarding Hotel Transylvania Transformania you guys have no idea how many messages and how many comments and posts that I've seen all across social media of people trying to, to how can I put this? They really want to try they really want to try to rile me up in order to really force out an angry expression out of me. Like, you have no idea how many comments that I've seen of people trying to say, Oh, I can't wait to see Animat rip up this movie. Oh, I can't wait to see Animat tear this thing to shreds. Oh, Animat, I got a surprise for you. You might not like it. Oh, I don't think Animat is going to be happy with this news at all. Oh, Animat's going to be pissed with this announcement. Like, I've seen all this kind... Like, I've seen all these reactions. And yes, people to this day, people are still going at it, trying to go and really, uh... How can I put this? Add fuel to the fire onto the Sony hate. I mean, it's already been years since I've moved on and that many people have moved on. And that, like, you, you guys probably know that you moved on as well from, like, the whole Sony thing uh, in the past with me and all that kind of stuff. But I just want to say, you would honestly be pretty shocked to know that there are still plenty of people out there who not only love that Sony hate thing, but they also want to try to continue it, that they, they still want to keep, keep that act going, despite the fact that I've clearly shown that I've moved on from it, but some people have not. And some people still love that Sony hate thing that I've done many years ago. That they still want, that they want to try to bring that back from me. So, anyways though, with all that said, just wanted to get that out of the way and just put out my comments onto those things. Those are not going to be what I'm going to be talking about in terms of this story right over here. This is actually going to be something a little bit different. And what I'm going to be talking about is regarding the biggest news related to Sony Pictures. And what I'm talking about is their major deal with Netflix. Yes, it is official. Netflix is going to be the official streaming home of Sony Pictures. Now, what basically happened was that ever since 2005, Sony Pictures has this deal with Stars, which is owned by Lionsgate, and they're this uh, cable company that would go and distribute movies on television or on other platforms like streaming and stuff like that. Like, it's mostly stars that would go and handle that kind of thing for Sony Pictures. And it's been a while that they have been doing that. And as you could probably imagine, in recent years, stars really isn't what it used to be, especially nowadays that we have entered upon the uh, streaming wars. So from there, Sony decided, okay, they're going to go and move on to something else, that they want to try something a little bit different. 
And apparently, according to this article on Deadline, they did state that there was apparently a bit of a bidding war and a bit of a fight in order to go and get the uh, distribution rights or the streaming distribution rights to the Sony Pictures movies. But Netflix ultimately prevailed with uh, what seems to be a deal that is stated to be over $1 billion dollars for a total of four years to keep that partnership with Sony Pictures. So that's basically the origin story of what, how this deal even happened. But what does this mean right now? What does this mean for both Netflix and especially for Sony Pictures? Well, one thing I could say right now is that this isn't going to be immediate. This is going to be happening starting in 2022 because that uh, the end of 2021, that's going to be when Sony's deal with stars is going to expire. But when Sony is going to have that partnership with Netflix in 2022... What's going to happen is that not necessarily a whole lot is actually going to change. Because from there, um, Sony would go and they would do the usual stuff. They would start things off by releasing their movies on the big screen. They would start things off by releasing them in theaters. And then after that, they would go and have their release on home media. Releasing it on digital, on DVD, Blu-ray, 4K, and all that kind of stuff. But then a little bit afterwards, like once they had their full lineup of distribution completed, that's when they would go and take their movies and give it to Netflix, where once they do appear on Netflix, then Netflix would have an 18-month exclusive deal where the only place that you can find those movies are going to be on that specific streaming service. It's only going to be on Netflix that you can go and find that. And starting in 2022, Sony did promise that they're going to have some big movies that are going to be coming up. Uh, they already got the Uncharted movie that's coming soon. Uh, they got Where the Crawdad Sings, where they got Bullet Train. And they even got some of their uh, Spider-Man movies that are going to be coming up, like Morbius. And especially, probably, the most anticipated Sony Pictures film uh, currently right now is the sequel to Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Along with uh, franchise movies that they have coming up, uh, which they are planning to do more sequels, such as Venom, Jumanji, and Bad Boys. And uh, by the way, with that said, we now have a couple of quotes that uh, I would like to go and read here. And the first one shall be the, uh, uh, the film chief at Netflix, uh, Scott Stubber, in which he states... Sony Pictures is a great partner, and we are thrilled to expand our relationship through this forward-thinking agreement. This not only allows us to bring their impressive slate of beloved film franchises and new IPs to Netflix in the U.S., but it also establishes a new source of first-run films for Netflix movie lovers worldwide. And by the way, that is also something I almost forgot to mention. Uh, another part of the deal is that if ever Sony Pictures would want to go and make streaming movies, that they don't necessarily want to go and release it in theaters, but instead put it out on some kind of streaming service, then it'll not only will it immediately go to Netflix, but Netflix will also come into the production as well and help them out in order to have uh, a first look into the making of that particular feature. So this is why I am saying that this is a partnership where Netflix and Sony, in some ways, not only are, are they going to help each other out in order to go and distribute films, but they're also going to go and help them out in terms of actually making them as well. Uh, I do believe... Do we have another quote here? Ah, yes. Okay, yeah. We do have another quote, which is coming from the uh, chief of uh, distribution and networks at Sony, Keith Legoy, in which he states that this exciting agreement demonstrates the importance of that content to our distribution partners as they grow their audience and deliver the very best in entertainment. So that's pretty much the big story, is that starting in 2022... So Netflix will become the exclusive streaming home of Sony Pictures, where in a way, Sony does have a streaming service of their own, but it's mostly going to be in the form of Netflix, where, yeah, they don't own Netflix, of course, but if you want to find the Sony movies, it's going to be on Netflix. 
And I'm just going to say right now, honestly, that um, this seems to be a direction that, yeah, it is to be expected. I think this is a direction that a lot of people would definitely predict that this would absolutely go, that this would definitely be uh, the obvious choice for Sony to do with Netflix, or if there is any streaming service that Sony would actually do, uh, like if there is a streaming service Sony Pictures would actually go with in order to make some kind of partnership, it would definitely be Netflix. And I think the first obvious clue is regarding some of the upcoming Sony Pictures animation films. You might remember earlier in the year, uh, it was actually announced that not just uh, Wish Dragon, but the Mitchells vs. the Machines are going to be skipping theaters entirely and go directly to Netflix. Uh, what now one thing I will say though it is uh, it was actually quite surprising to see that Sony is not doing the same thing with the fourth Hotel Transylvania film because I was actually debating if maybe they would go towards the same route with that one uh, but it, they did announce by the way that it is going to be exclu uh, it would first appear only in theaters which I can imagine Netflix is just looking looking at Sony going ah, darn it Missed my chance. Uh, because that would definitely be a movie that Netflix would adore having it exclusively in their streaming service. But anyways, uh, going back into this, yes, it is pretty obvious. And honestly, at this point, I gotta say, this is probably both the smart... This is the smartest move for both Sony Pictures and for Netflix. Because this is probably the best way that they can do in order to move forward, not only to keep themselves afloat in these uh, current times, but especially to keep themselves afloat in the uh, streaming wars. First of all, this is very good for Sony Pictures. And uh, the reason why I would say that is mainly because of the fact that, as you could probably tell, Sony doesn't currently have a streaming service, or at least one that could be useful to be a, a, a competitor in the streaming wars right now. And at this point, considering that the streaming wars are currently in full swing, it would be way too late for Sony Pictures to go and make their own streaming service, to take all their uh, movies and TV shows and take all their content away from other um, uh, other streaming services in order to go and make their own. It's way too late for that. And they know very well that in the streaming wars, not many people would legitimately want to have a Sony Pictures exclusive streaming service that they know that too many people are going to sacrifice that one in favor of keeping stuff like Netflix, Disney Plus, HBO Max, and all that kind of stuff. So they know they can't be that much of a competitor to begin with. So they pretty much have a mentality of if you can't beat them, if you can't beat them, you might as well join them, and you might as well go and collaborate with with uh, what is currently right now the strongest competitor in terms of streaming services. Like, right now, a lot of people, like, millions upon millions of people are already subscribed to Netflix. So, you might as well go and collaborate with those who are already at the top. And making that the exclusive home, well, you're, you pretty much got, got a bit of a leg up in the competition because now you're pretty, like, now... You, you pretty much have this um, top competitor that you can go and rely on so that you could stay within the competition, that you could stay afloat uh, in, in, the ba in this uh, big competitive industry right now. And it is a unique way. It's not really a, a way that a lot of the companies are doing nowadays, but it, it is a bit of a smart move for Sony's position right now to go and collaborate with Netflix. Although I will say right now that there is also another side to it that maybe so maybe Sony Pictures would have to be a little bit careful right now because now this means that they're going to become a little bit more dependent on Netflix in order to stay afloat in the uh, competition. And you never know it, with uh, Netflix and uh, Netflix's intentions if uh, they maybe they will become bigger and bigger and potentially 
it could it could ultimately become like a massive assimilation where the collaboration becomes bigger and bigger and bigger down to the point where like the the, the line between what is Netflix and what is Sony Pictures will will become blurred and then suddenly boom a full on assimilation and a full on buyout where Netflix just pretty much takes Sony Pictures as a whole that could be one thing that they got to be careful but then again maybe it's just a little bit of a crazy insane theory that is in my head but Again, in the current climate that we are right now in terms of entertainment, Sony Pictures did pull off the correct move. This is the best thing that they can do. At the same time, this is also a really smart move for Netflix as well. And the reason why this is good for them is that now that the streaming wars has become a lot more competitive, Netflix it really does need uh, some partnerships. They really need some alliances because, as you could probably imagine, uh, the more competitive it is now that like other major studios want to have their own ma uh, their own big name streaming service in order to fight against Netflix. Netflix right now has become, uh, like, now they have been in a much more vulnerable spot. You have probably heard the news recently, or maybe sometime this week, that Netflix did actually lose a massive amount of value. I believe, if I am correct, they say about 20% um, of Netflix's value has actually decreased because of the streaming wars, because uh, that there are more streaming services that are currently available that people... People also want to go and get and consume at the same time that they're looking at uh, HBO Max, that they're looking at Disney Plus, that they're looking at Paramount Plus, that they're looking at Peacock, that they're looking at Hulu, at Amazon, at Apple TV Plus and all that kind of stuff that now it has become a lot more competitive and Netflix is not on its own and it really shows. And especially nowadays, uh, considering that these studios are distancing themselves from Netflix, that instead of being a, a, a friend, now they want to be an enemy to Netflix by using their movie collection, by taking them away from Netflix and putting them on their own streaming service, it does put Netflix more and more into a vulnerable spot. And also, um, I'm not sure if this is something that will happen, but this is something that I have heard in terms of rumors that there is a possibility that Universal might be the next one to go and uh, really boost up their streaming service and really hit Netflix hard to make them even more vulnerable. That apparently right now Comcast is currently in talks to see that maybe they will take all their content and remove them from stuff like Netflix on Hulu and HBO Max in order to fully reboot Peacock, in order to make them a bigger and more prominent streaming service to be more competitive in the uh, streaming wars to make uh, to make Peacock the official universal streaming service. And if that actually does happen, that that I can guarantee you is going to be a massive blow to Netflix, where they are going to be losing some of their biggest content. They're going to be like, especially the family films. By the way, like say what you will about some of the current stuff from DreamWorks, or especially regarding the Illumination films. Those are some of the most popular content that you could actually find on Netflix. And I'll say right now, just the fact that they would lose something like the Despicable Me franchise, that's already going to be something that will pull, that, that will really be like a punch to the gut on Netflix. And they will be losing a lot of subscribers because of it, because those Despicable Me fans are going to follow, are, are going to follow the franchise to Peacock. That's going to be a major blow. And this is not even to mention some of their other major franchises, stuff like um, the, the Fast and Furious movies or the Jurassic World films and all that kind of stuff. So you could probably imagine how, uni like, if, uni if Universal plays its cards right, if they do, uh, like, if the rumors are true and they are going to follow to their word, then at that point, they're going to become a serious competitor and it's going to really devalue Netflix by that time. So you can probably imagine that Netflix is going to need some alliances with other studios in order to go and really keep themselves uh, as a major competitor to, to try to attempt to keep themselves at the top. So they're going to need all the help that they could possibly can. Yeah, some people could say that maybe when it comes to uh, Sony Pictures, yeah, they're not the best studio out there, but I mean, like, 
having some form of alliance is better than having no alliance whatsoever. So that's probably, so at, at least like they can get all the help that they could get. And if it's going to be from Sony, then so be it. Like, why not go and make the most out of like franchises such as Men in Black or Ghostbusters or uh, Bad Boys or Hotel Transylvania? In fact, a few of those franchises, especially the Hotel Transylvania franchise, is already prominently big on Netflix. So why not go and actually make the most of it? And by the way, one thing I could say is that like, this would seem more unlikely than the reverse that I've already talked about, but maybe there is also a little bit of a danger as well that um, maybe th this could be a sign that maybe, like, Sony Pictures could end up getting their own streaming service and they could end up swallowing Netflix whole if they don't, like, if they don't play their cards right. If Netflix isn't doing well in the future and that their value would prominently decrease, then maybe that could be an, an opportunity for the Sony Corporation to just swallow them whole and to make Netflix a uh, Sony streaming service. That could be a possibility as well. But in the current situation that it is right now, I think ultimately this is the best thing that these companies can do. That they are, like in a way, yes, they are both major studios, but for now, considering that things have become a lot more competitive in terms of the uh, movie industry, in terms of the entertainment industry, and in terms of the streaming industry, it's probably for the best that both Sony Pictures and for Netflix that they have to go and work together in order to fight off against some of the major ones, especially if they are rapidly growing and becoming a lot stronger, especially with Disney Plus, because it's only been about like, what, a year, like maybe around a year and a half that it's on and already they have gathered more than 100 million subscribers and still massively growing. Like, I, I, at this point, and not to mention the fact that they are, like, in, in this year alone, in 2021, they're already getting some of their biggest movies that are also going to be immediately available on Disney+, Plus, such as Cruella, Luca, as well as Black Widow, especially. That's really going to make Disney+, Plus much bigger, and could have a chance to actually really catch up to Netflix on a frightening level that maybe it'll happen sooner than we expect that Disney Plus could even overthrow Netflix to be at the top. So right now, this is the best thing that uh, uh, these two companies could, could do right now with both Netflix and with Sony Pictures. Again, the future is unpredictable. We don't know how this alliance is going to go and if it's, if it's going to end up in weird directions. But ultimately, this is the best of what both Netflix and what Sony Pictures can do in order to go and keep them afloat and in order for both these companies to stay within the entertainment industry and within the streaming industry so that they could still be considered tough competitors okay so with that said now i would like to go into the chat wall and i would like to ask you all what do you think about this alliance with netflix and sony pictures uh do you all feel like this is a pretty good idea do you think this is the best for netflix and sony pictures are you a little weary about this whole deal let me know what you all think Uh, let's see now, um, uh, I didn't expect this was a big week for Sony for their new water park and the new announcement from, uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife and Hotel Transylvania 4, and now a deal with Netflix. For the latter, I'm not surprised, and it's for the best since Netflix needs new content, with each movie studio getting their own streaming service, while Sony needs a partner to have their movies uh, to be streamed, so it makes sense. Good luck on both companies on their partnership while staying afloat in the competition. All right. Now, let's see what else we got. Um, well, considering how both The Mitchells vs. The Machines and Wish Dragon are now Netflix exclusives, who didn't see this coming? But even with that, I get why this deal exists, and I do anticipate what does come out of this. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> However, I'm not sure what it says about me when my biggest question of all this is, wait, there's going to be a fourth Jumanji movie? <laughs> well, I mean, you never know, man. Y you never know, because like with Sony, 
no, no matter what, they're always desperate to have a franchise, and they'll try their best to try to go and milk it for what it's worth. Like, I was even quite surprised to find out that Hotel Transylvania 4 was going to be the last Hotel Transylvania movie. I really did think that they were going to go full-on Ice Age with it and really desperately capitalize until there's, like, no money left to make on it, so... Yeah, like, you never know with, with Sony, but, they, like, no matter what, they will always be pretty desperate in order to go and, like, make a franchise. When they have a franchise, they really want to try to prominently make it big and everything, which sometimes don't necessarily work as well as they would hope. Uh, but anyways, um, this is a great idea. Can't wait to see... Uh, what this brings up, hopefully uh, a bump in quality when it comes to their movies and TV shows from Sony. I am definitely looking forward to the Mitchells versus the Machines. It looks awesome, but uh, what that means for Sony, uh, what the, what does this mean for the Sony Crackle app? Yeah, I think the I think Crackle is dead. I I, I think at this point, like you gotta let go to you you gotta let go of Crackle. I think it was like. Some kind of attempt for Sony to make their Netflix, but it just really didn't work out. I think, like, with the, with this whole thing, that's one major thing that uh, people were actually quite surprised about. Because some people were expecting that Sony would have their own streaming service. But now with this announcement, I think it's safe to say that those plans are pretty much dead. Uh, let's see, what, what else um, do we have here? This is a very interesting case. Uh, I saw it coming. But uh, don't many, uh, but don't may swallow them whole. And uh, quick side note, nice haircut. And it, isn't it, it, it isn't weird, but isn't it weird, but cool how NBC owns DreamWorks and ABC owns Disney. I say it's funny, but uh, both them and rivals got their own rights. Uh, rest in peace, Prince Charles. Well, Prince, Prince Charles is not the one that's dead. It's Prince Philip, isn't it? But yeah, okay, so... Um, uh, let's see what else we got here. I think this is for the best. Uh, considering Sony doesn't have a streaming service, yet they need a home for their movies. Also, I could see this help their movies a lot more because they can't keep delaying their movies forever because of the pandemic. Oh, yeah, especially. Like, th like that. that's also a major thing why they need to do this, especially for Sony's part. They need a new strategy in order to actually go and make, uh, make some revenue, in order to go and actually make a profit. And especially, like, not just to keep them afloat uh, in the long run, but especially for right now uh, in order to keep them alive. Because you could probably imagine how this is a... Ma like, this whole pandemic is a massive blow to Sony Pictures. That, they, like, they have been damaged hard. Yeah, they're, they could be as transparent as YouTube when it comes to how they are in terms as a, in terms of a business. That, like, they're not going to say it, but we know very well that... Uh, the financial situation is pretty critical at Sony Pictures. So, yeah, they would need to try to revise many of their uh, business plans in order to keep moving forward. And, yeah, that's also a major reason is because right now they're not in the best financial situation and that they need a new plan to keep themselves afloat for the long run. Uh, let's see now. Uh, the best way I can describe this deal, which is... Finally! Because seriously, I knew so Sony would follow suit. However, uh, the only thing I'm very concerned about is the 2021 films will be a part of the deal as well besides the 2022 films. Unfortunately, I have to say no, because the deal starts in 2022. So it's only starting with those films that they are going to go and really make this deal actually happen. When it comes to uh, the 2021 films right now, like if you are expecting anything from any of Sony's big movies like Hotel Transylvania 4 or Peter Rabbit 2 or something, uh, or even uh, the second Venom film, I don't think they will fall into that category as well because they are from 2021, so it's a little too late for them. They're going to be stuck within the Stars deal, whereas next year, those movies are going to be falling under the Netflix deal. Uh, let's see, what else uh, do we have over here? Uh, let's see. This is a smart move for both Netflix and Sony. Netflix will have a studio providing them with Hollywood films after Disney, Universal, Warner Brothers, and Paramount started their own streaming service. And Sony will be getting a lot of licensing money, which is less risky than starting a service from scratch, even though they used to have with Crackle. 
Uh, all right. I think um, I'm going to go and read one more comment before we're going to jump into the next story. Uh, let's see. I am glad that they're not delaying their movies, so I don't mind them releasing it on Netflix. I am still surprised, but hey, at least they won't delay their movies unless it's uh, one of their bigger movies. I am excited for Mitchells vs. the Machines and Wish Dragon, but since I don't have Netflix, I will probably have to wait for them on DVD. Well, yeah, I think, but that that that's the thing with um that that's the thing with the whole deal is that uh they will start things off with their movies being released in theaters, then there's a home media, and then it's Netflix. So you'll like if you want to get it on DVD or uh, Blu-ray or something, then you can actually go and um, get it earlier than it would be on Netflix. However, I will say right now though that considering that uh, Sony did sell the exclusive distribution rights to Netflix. I'm just going to say right now, when it comes to the Mitchells versus the Machines, I honestly have no clue if they're even going to have a uh, DVD or Blu-ray release. That's honestly going to be something that we will have to wait and see. Okay, so... When it comes to our next story right over here, we're going to talk about something that happened last week. Now, I know I kind of skipped it because I had my whole animation look back after party special, but I figured, you know what? It's still young. It's still fresh. And uh, I'm sure there are plenty of things that people still want to go and actually want to discuss regarding this trailer in particular. And it definitely was the biggest trailer that was released last week. So with that said, let us go and take a look at the trailer for the next big Warner Brothers movie that's coming out this summer, Space Jam, A New Legacy. Oop, hold on Basketball camp is next we weekend. You got amazing potential on the court, and I can help you get there. That's not what I want, Dad. You never let me do what I want to do. You never let me just do me. Hold up, wrong floor. That Will Smith ain't got to deal with this. Dad! Down! What in the Matrix hell? Welcome to the space. The space. Welcome to the space. Welcome, King James. I am the king of this domain. This is the serververse. What'd you do to my son? Where's Dom? The only way you're getting your son back is if you and I play a little basketball. Pete, send this clown to the rejects. Wait. What is this? Ah! I'm a cartoon? Meep. What's up, Doc? Come on and ride, baby, ride! I need to assemble an elite team to help give my son back. I know what you're looking for. So shoot, baby, shoot! A dream team. Mom, shoot the ball! Let's try that again, shall we? King James. Welcome to the Space Jam. Introducing the Goon Squad. You gotta win this game. Let's end this. Yes, you cry? And get our son back. Oh. Yikes. <laughs> Classic. Welcome to the space camp. I'm going old school on his butt. Whoa. To the Space Jam. And that was Space Jam A New Legacy. The upcoming movie, the highly anticipated movie to which shall be coming out 
on July 16th. And one thing I will say is that this is not going towards the direction that, honestly, I thought it was going. Because th this trailer here definitely showed a lot of major surprises when it comes to what this movie is going to offer. In fact, uh, you could say that it is definitely following a completely different set of rules uh, to what the original Space Jam has already established. And, and one thing that I will say, though, is that the, probably the first thing that I have noticed is that with Space Jam A New Legacy, they're pretty much turning Space Jam into Kingdom Hearts. This is like the Warner Brothers equivalent of Kingdom Hearts. Like, really think about it. Um, like, you got this human lead. Like, you got the human lead, which in this case is played by uh, LeBron James. So, you got LeBron James here. He's pretty much the Sora character. He's the human lead in which he has to go and team up with some of the most popular cartoon characters. So, instead of, uh, uh, instead of teaming up with uh, Goofy and Donald, he would go and team up with the Looney Tunes characters. And not only that, but there is also the world setting as well. Like, it, like look at the scene where you see, um, like, like not not here, but like, yeah, this part where you see, um, Le where you see LeBron falling down into this like universe where you see all these different planets. Like, look at all the planets here. Like, you saw that he's going through this, um, like, he, he just went through uh, Game of Thrones world, and then, like, he just passed through a Wizard of Oz world, and then, like, I, I just noticed right here, like, you see this Flintstone world. Like, you, you see all these different worlds where each IP has their own represented planet, kind of like what they did in Kingdom Hearts as well. And right now, what they gotta do is that these characters and LeBron James has to go and team up in order to fight against these uh, the, these creatures, these evil monsters known as uh, the Goon Squad, which they're pretty much like uh, the Heartless, and especially considering that they are more like the big boss, you got a, you got like this uh, creative array here of like these original villains, which I'm surprised they are original villains actually. Like yeah, like you got this Birdman. Like, you got the speed guy, you got the snake girl, you got spider dude, you got a water guy, you got a fire guy. Like, you got all these characters, uh, like, all these different villains that the characters have to face. And this is, uh, by the way, this is also another uh, comparison that I realized, is that technically, all these classic cartoon characters are turned into CGI. And that's another major thing that I will get into later, is the fact that these is that the classic cartoon characters we all know and love are now in CG. They are in 3D right now, a medium in which many people are not necessarily used to seeing them. Normally, we would be more accustomed to seeing them in uh, 2D. Like, th th that's what we're more used to. It it's seeing the characters like this more so than something like in uh, 3D, by the way. And uh, I remember I did mention that on social media, and a lot of people would go and debate and say that technically there is a, a better comparison instead of Kingdom Hearts, and that is Ready Player One, especially since that one is also another Warner Brothers movie. And you could definitely see like uh, the different the, the ways where it's more connected with that, especially when it's technically set in this. Um, computer world it's uh technically uh, this is called the server verse so everything is digital everything is like in this massive computer that's uh, that's where they got the uh connection with um with ready player one not to mention that this is technically a uh th this is technically a warner brothers movie so of course the warner brothers properties are the most prominent and you even see like um you got all these different characters coming in. Like, um, you got this part where you would see... Yeah, like, you got... Uh, and here's another one. You got the freaking Iron Giant as well making a comeback. And then you see all these different uh, cameos as well. Like, you got uh, the Hanna-Barbera characters. Like, you got King Kong over here. And then, of course, uh, we also got, at the same time, surprisingly, many people even pointed out that, like, along with King Kong, you also got the characters from... Um, 
from Smallfoot as well, which is which is funny by by the way, considering that we got Michi coming back here. Yet Zendaya is also returning to uh, Space Jam: A New Legacy, but this time she's going to be the voice of Lola. So like you got this massive crossover that is currently happening as well as um, a variety of different characters. And by the way, there is one um, cameo that I would say I don't know where to find it, but probably. Uh, the most controversial appearance among all these different people. I don't know where to find it, but there was actually one shot uh, where people actually found that... Or maybe it was just an image, by the way. Yeah, mo most likely an image, I would say. Where they actually found uh, the Droogs from uh, A Clockwork Orange. And a lot of people consider that to be very hypocritical of... Um, it, it was very hypocritical of Warner Brothers to do so. I mean, they would go and remove Pepe Le Pew, but you would keep the freaking Droogs. And if you have seen... Uh, if you have seen A Clockwork Orange, then you see the massive problem here. Like, at the very least, with Pepe Le Pew, compared to the Droogs from A Clockwork Orange, Pepe can understand a little bit of what it could possibly mean to have consent. With the drugs, however, they don't freaking care about consent at all. They just go all out with their ultra-violence. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, so, and even over here, you, you see, like, a whole bunch of cameos. Like, you see a flying monkey from Wizard of Oz. You see, um, like, you see one of the villains from The Matrix. You see a little cameo from Pennywise from It!, like, you, you got all these, like, you got a, like, this is where, th this is a movie where you got, like, a, a, like, cameos galore in here. And that's another major comparison to Ready Player One. So, I think the best way to describe Space Jam A New Legacy is that this very much is, uh, like, if you would go and combine Ready Player One with Kingdom Hearts and you somehow add in the plot line of Space Jam and there you have it. But with that said, though, uh, there are some surprises that I did mention uh, that are included in here that, honestly, I was surprised to find. Like, one major one that I would say is regarding the 2D world where we are introduced to the Looney Tunes characters. And one major change that they have done compared to the original Space Jam is the fact that now LeBron James as well is a cartoon. Like, that is one thing that did surprise me, and I think that is actually a pretty uh, clever touch to put onto this uh, to this movie, where if you're going to go in the cartoon world, then you too, as well, will become a 2D animated cartoon. That, I will have to say, is actually pretty clever. Now, a downside to it is that I do feel like there is a bit of a downgrade in terms of the 2D animation. I feel like it's not as strong as in the original Space Jam. I feel like the, the animation that they have presented here uh, feels a little bit more like the kind of 2D animation you would expect out of like the, the the promos and stuff like that the stuff that they would reserve for trailers well not for trailers but I mean like for promos that you would find on TV or like for little animated shorts that they would put up on YouTube but um, other than that though I do find this is like a clever idea that they would uh, bring in LeBron James and make him a cartoon as well also another surprising thing is regarding the fact that when they go into the 3d world then by that point, that's when everybody becomes 3D, including the Looney Tunes characters. And this, I gotta say, is a little bit of a... Maybe something that I would find to be something I would have to get accustomed to. Because, yeah, it is weird seeing the Looney Tunes in 3D. But I, I think one thing I will say that... It feels a bit strange. Like, I, I will say, like, the designs do stay true to their original look. And it is pretty nice. But I think one thing I do find strange is the fact that they give them realistic textures. Like, um, here, let's have a, a closer look at uh, Bugs Bunny, for example. Like, yeah, you look at Bugs, and he ha like, you see the amount of detail that they add in. Like, they add in so much fur. Like, all this realistic texture and fur onto him. I don't know. There's something about it that I just find... That it just feels a little bit off. It feels a little bit strange. Maybe I'll be accustomed to, but I, I will say, like, 
there's something, I don't know, may, maybe like watching the movie, I'll get used to it and I'll appreciate the 3D animation a bit more, but there's just something about the uh, 3D, I don't know, there's just something about the 3D designs of the Looney Tunes characters that it just feels a little bit strange. It just feels um, a, a little bit off here. I don't know, there's just something I can't really put my finger onto uh, regarding this. So, but with that said, though, with, with all that said, I will say that this is definitely a feast for the eyes, and I think that's the best way to describe Space Jam: The New Leg, uh, A New Legacy, is the fact that everything you see here um, really is visually stunning, especially in terms of the concepts, the way that they would create all these di all these different worlds and these different universes uh, for all the different IPs that Warner Brothers has right now. Like, it definitely is something that looks like can be absolutely fun to watch, especially with the variety of cameos uh, that they would include here. Like, it's very much in the ranks of a movie such as um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit or The Lego Movie or Ralph Breaks the Internet or Ready Player One, where part of the fun of watching this film is going to be pointing out all the different cameos, which does give it a bit of rewatchability because I'm sure, especially with this audience right over here, people can go and point out all the different uh, uh, characters that they could actually go and find. Like here, I'll, I'll go and find a better shot where you can actually see like the different, yeah, like this shot over here, especially where you see all these different cameos where you got, like you got Jabberjaw here, you got Yogi and Boo Boo, you got uh, the Flintstones, you got Magilla Gorilla. Like you got all these different characters and it'll probably, you might need some time in order to actually like carefully find oh and i like even right now i just discovered like right over here right under uh captain caveman you see the jetsons that are just flying around like they're under captain caveman and over uh the characters from smallfoot so like you got like part of the fun will be looking into all these cameos but with that said, though, there is also one thing that I just want to go and criticize. If there is one major problem uh, that I have with this is the fact that I think it's no secret to say that uh, the story sucks. Like, this story that they are already presenting here, yeah, I, I think like it pretty much laid out what this entire movie is all about. And I mean, yeah, the, 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 the story from the original Space Jam is not all that great either. But, uh, with this one, I think it's pretty obvious where it's going. It, it's very, like, the best comparison in terms of the story is, uh, Hook. Like, you might remember the early 90s movie with Dustin Hoffman and Robin Williams, where basically this whole, the, the whole plot is, um, this dad is trying to connect with his son, but he's having a hard time to do so. But suddenly the son is in danger and now he is sight like now the son is siding with the villains. Uh, there's even one shot here where they even show uh, that the kid is actually on the side of the villains like he's on the bench with yeah right, right over here where like he's on the bench hanging out with all these different villains and uh, he looks like he's actually going to be a part of the goon squad and um, the whole mission for LeBron James is to go and save his son in order to go and save the bond as well to in order to have that father son bonding thing going on so it, it's very much very similar to uh, uh to very very similar to uh hook but you also throw in that element of basketball you add in that element of space jam where you gotta save the world with the power of basketball like we're gonna settle everything with this one basketball match where i got my team of villains where you got to fight against and you have your team of Looney Tunes characters. That that that's pretty much the big picture uh that that we do have in terms of the story. And we know how this is going to go. We know how this is going to be predictable. And I think it's safe to say that nobody here is going to go and watch it in order to find uh, a legitimate story. No one's going to be watching Space Jam because they want to see a compelling story and they want to see high-quality writing. That's not going to happen in Space Jam no matter what. Ultimately, what they are pretty much showing here is basically a novelty movie. And I would even say that it looks like Space Jam A New Legacy is one step closer to becoming what, what is essentially this massive... Uh, novelty movie where like the reason why you want to watch it is 
all because of the novelty. It's all because of the visuals that they would go and present. It's because of the novelty of Space Jam coming back, of having a Space Jam sequel. It's the novelty of all the cameos uh, that are going to be happening at the same time. This mega crossover of all these different Warner Brothers properties in the same way that they did so with the Lego movies and Ready Player One. And... Yeah, ultimately, it's just a novelty movie. It knows what its audience wants, and it's it's gonna go and deliver on that. It doesn't ca- it, it doesn't care if it's actually gonna go and try to make a, a feature film. They're not there to go and actually provide a high quality movie. Instead, what they want to do is just provide a uh, just you know just a, a dumb little popcorn flick. It really is just to see Space Jam being Space Jam and nothing else. And if people want to see it, then people want to, like, those who want to see it, they are going to be the ones that will like it. And I, I think that's bas- basically the best way to put it, is that, like, whatever opinion you may have right now about Space Jam and New Legacy, there's a 99% chance that it'll be exactly that when you would go and watch it. If you're interested in seeing it, if you want to see it, you're going to like it. If you have no interest whatsoever, if you think this is dumb, then it will be dumb for you. So honestly, I think that's the uh, that's honestly my big take on Space Jam and A New Legacy. I mean, I'm not expecting a good movie out of this, but it looks like it could be fun. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so with that said, uh, for those of you who are interested in checking it out, remember that the movie shall be coming out on July 16th. And with that said, let us now go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, what do you think about this trailer of Space Jam A New Legacy? Uh, are you guys interested in checking it out? Uh, are you guys uh, not really into it? Do you like what, what you've been seeing? Are you turned off by uh, the trailer itself? Let me know what you all think. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, what do we have here? Um... <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm definitely jazzed for LeBron James into the Cheetleverse. Uh, the visuals are freaking insane. LeBron gives off uh, a decent performance so far, and the cameos are decently well implemented, particularly with Smallfoot, since this also stars Zendaya and LeBron James. Oh, yeah, that is actually true. I almost forgot that LeBron James was also in Smallfoot. Like, that kind of escaped my mind, actually. Good good eye there. Good eye there. Uh, good eye there, dude. Uh, but... I will only see it if they make LeBron's secret stuff, not a bottle, but in a can of Sprite Cranberry. Now, I know that some people may think this is just a dumb joke, and you may think you're just doing a dumb joke, but you gotta keep in mind, this is Space Jam. This could legitimately happen. In fact, I already see that there is a major brand deal going on with, uh, this, uh, with this Space Jam movie. I don't know if you, if you may have noticed... But uh, there is a little extra cameo that I will say uh, is included as well. I don't know. Like, I, I, I want to find... Uh, with the, I don't know. There's one... Okay, yeah. May, maybe this will help. Okay. Take a look at... Uh, like, l- take a look at Lola. Take a look at the CG Lola. You may find that she might have a familiar mark on her. It's Nike. Like, on, on the jersey of, uh, of the Toon Squad, they actually have a Nike logo. So, yeah, Space Jam will definitely not be shy in terms of having these brand deals. And I think, honestly, by the way, I find it to be perfect that uh, their, their, their jerseys are sponsored by Nike, considering that the origins of Space Jam is actually from a Nike commercial where Michael Jordan would team up with Bugs Bunny on their little shenanigans just to, just to, stel- just to uh, sell stuff like Air Jordans and stuff like that. So yeah, like you may joke about like, oh, LeBron James's secret stuff is Sprite Cranberry, but you never know, man. It could happen. It could legitimately happen. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, I must say, I'm very impressed of this trailer, and it did give me a Ready Player One feel. Imagine, oh, uh, Ready Player One feel. 
Imagine this film was actually directed by Steven Spielberg and the 3D animation design looks great. They kind of remind me of a Pokemon design in the Detective Pikachu movie and Sonic design. Uh, I hope it is worth, uh, oh, I hope it is worth the wait and better than Scoob and Tom and Jerry. Well, okay. One thing I can say, it'll definitely be easy to be better than Tom and Jerry. Better than Scoob, however... I don't know. If I would make a prediction, I would feel like maybe this could be in the same league as Scoob. Maybe. I don't know. Like, for me, like, if I would have to give it a rating, I'm predicting maybe like a 5 or a five out of 10 or somewhere around that, give or take. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, I, think it, I think it's a safe bet to say that the crossover film has become its own genre thanks to both, both this film and Ralph Breaks the Internet. Yet, I hope this movie ends up at least decent in the end, even if the story is weak. But if, if the Animaniacs characters are appearing in this movie, will they also include the others besides Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, like Pinky and the Brain, Dr. Uh, Scratch, and, Scratch and Sniff, Slappy Squirrel, etc.? I mean, with the, uh, with the huge amount of cameos that they do have, I think, honestly, they would only be limited to just uh, the, the Warners and Pinky and the Brain, if they would go and include uh, Animaniacs cameos, or even if they will, uh, no, actually, you know, come to think of it, they will acknowledge, yeah, I was about to say, is like, are they even going to acknowledge their TV shows? And then I realized, oh yeah, no, they're heavily promoting, uh, like, uh, like Game of Thrones is heavily prominent, so most likely, so who knows, maybe they will have uh, Animaniacs cameos, Th that is a possibility there. And also, one thing I will say is, um, what would be the cause of it? What would be the one that really started it all? Like, debatably, I wouldn't say it was Ralph Breaks the Internet or Ready Player One or even this film. I think it goes even beforehand. Uh, like, uh, honestly, like, even, of course, there are movies that have done that beforehand. Like, we've seen plenty of other movies, like, uh, like the original Wreck-It Ralph, for example. That would technically count with all the video game cameos. And then there's also, of course, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But if there is one movie that I would say is the cause of this, I would say it's the Lego movie. I think the Lego movie is the one that is responsible for trying to make all these cameos. And especially considering that Warner Brothers did lose their license on making more Lego movies because of the massive failure of the Lego Ninjago movie and Lego Movie 2, I think Warner Brothers is trying to find an excuse to make things up for losing the Lego movie. So that's why they would want to go and um, try to do like this massive cameos galore like what they are doing now with Space Jam and New Legacy. So I I'm just going to say, if there is, uh, like, if you want to find uh, a culprit of who's the one responsible for having all these mega cameos happen in movies like Ready Player One, Ralph Breaks the Internet, and Space Jam and New Legacy, I would say it's the Lego movie. I I'm just saying, and I mean... Like, would would you say I'm wrong for for saying that Lego Movie is a ma is a massive inspiration in terms of the modern filmmaking style that we are seeing right now? I I'm just saying, people. I'm just saying. Uh, let's see now. I am actually looking forward to this. Uh, I actually love the visuals. And an example how making normally 2D cartoon icons becoming 3D can be done right. Uh, uh, for the most part, cannot wait to watch. And why is Twitch censoring Looney? Congrats on finishing uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios Plus. And sorry about the Prince Charles typo. I did mean th Philip. Oh, okay, okay. So you did mean that. Uh, let's see now. As someone who finds Space Jam a classic guilty pleasure, this trailer looks really awesome. The CGI looks great, the performance of LeBron James is surprisingly good, and that sweet, sweet hand-drawn has come back and it looks amazing. Uh, I'm hyped for this movie to come out. However, if I don't see LeBron James, ask someone if they want a Sprite Cranberry, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be very disappointed. Again, chances are it could happen. It's Space Jam. And anything could really happen. Even in the most ludicrous product placements, they will do it. Uh, let's see. I'm pretty interested in this. Uh, sure, the story doesn't look great. Then again, even the original has a dumb story as well. But I am looking forward to watching it for the crossover and hand-drawn animation. And CGI look uh, does look very good. Much better than Tom and Jerry. Uh, which tried to do both together and that failed hard. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Alright, so uh, I'll go and read one more comment before we jump into the next story. 
Who's ready for the Space Jam? The story is nothing special, but the 2D animation looks really smooth. The CGI version of these characters uh, does look really good, and it stays true to the original look. And I do like the designs of the goons. Uh, let's just hope that the Warner Brothers will not try to mimic Kingdom Hearts too much and make the story and lore impossible to comprehend. I mean, yeah, that, that's probably the one good thing that they have done uh, that's not going to be like Space Jam, is that they're not going to have some complex or convoluted plot uh, where they want to make things way too complicated than they should. I mean, it's Looney Tunes characters playing basketball. You cannot mess that up in terms of making that complicated. So, again, if you are excited to go and see Space Jam A New Legacy, then all you have to do is wait until July 16th when it will come out both in theaters and on HBO Max. Okay, so let's jump on to our next story. And I understand that some people may look at this and may tell me, well, come on, Matt. Like, really, you're going to talk about Space Jam, a new, ne a new legacy now? That's old crap, man. That already happened. I want some new stuff. Can you show me something that is new? Okay, you want something new? I got something new for you. Don't you worry. Because I actually do have another trailer. And this is regarding something that... Uh, uh, this is actually a trailer that not many people have heard about. This is not a popular trailer. This is not really a very talked about movie as much as Space Jam and New Legacy. But what this movie does talk about is immediately recognizable. And I will admit this is a last minute edition, so this is honestly my first time seeing this trailer as well. So with that said, let us go ahead and check out the trailer for the upcoming documentary, Street Gang. Hold on. There we go. You gotta come in now? Can this was an experiment. Okay, thank you. For it. No one had ever seen anything like it. I wanted to capture the family aura. Hi, Bert. Ah, 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 Ernie. But I don't think any of us sat there thinking, oh my God, we're changing the world. Joan had a brilliantly simple notion. Children were watching a tremendous amount of television. So why not see if it could educate them? I love the whole idea of taking commercial techniques and applying them to a show for kids. I was convinced that it would be impossible to do. One, two, three, four, five. Jim Henson, Frank Oz, if they were on, you had a good day. We're the mm -hmm. best of friends. Yes. How many lines do you have? Three. Three. <laughs> well, I'll try to get the first one better. <laughs> I had become intellectually and spiritually involved with the civil rights movement. Those were revolutionary times. I saw it as a political show. There's no question that we're integrated. That's our worst sin. I'm happy to be a sinner. Beautiful children will grow up. And make the whole world beautiful. Right on. To be on the set, watching this dynamic. It was magic. It was people dedicated to a real ideal and having the will to do it. It was all of us having the time of our lives, writing silly things, but always with this message that television could be socially valuable. We're not sure what we are or what we can be. We know there's potential. And the realization to accept ourselves, that's what Sesame Street's about. And yes, that was Street Gang, How We Got to Sesame Street. An upcoming documentary that is all about, of course, Sesame Street. Chronicling the history and the impact that it has in our culture and how it ultimately became the most beloved, the most popular, and the biggest 
educational children's show. Oh, excuse me. That is my lunch making a comeback. Uh, as I was saying, uh, basically the biggest, yeah, the biggest uh, children's educational show in history. And I have heard about this for a while. This was um, this was a documentary that was actually presented uh, in the Sundance Film Festival. And it did get a lot of buzz. It did get a lot of attention. And it was actually very well received as well. And now that we are getting our, our first look onto this, uh, this honestly is quite a fascinating documentary. I I'm sure some of you have already known about the history of Sesame Street. In fact, uh, you have probably seen the, uh, the, uh, the miniseries that Defunct Land had de dedicated to the entirety of Jim Henson's life. And one video that is specifically dedicated to uh, the, the making of Sesame Street and like looking into its entire history. And from there, I will say that it looks like with Street Gang, they're going to go much bigger into it. It looks like they're going to look into uh, a wider scope into the impact on Sesame Street, especially back in its origins. It looks like it's going to take a, a bigger risk, a, a, like a talk about some bigger, some more serious subject matter than I would expect. Like, of course, they would go into the fun elements about making Sesame Street and uh, how Jim Henson and the gang all got together and decided to do this uh, special educational show and what, what are the origins of it where they, like, this was back, like, during the beginning of television where they decided that a novelty idea was to go and create an educational show to teach children as they are watching television, considering that it was at a time where kids were really starting to glue their eyes onto the TV set. So might as well give them some tasteful, con uh, some tasteful content where they might actually learn some valuable lessons uh, and, and not just moral lessons, but, uh, regarding, uh, numbers, regarding letters, uh, regarding, you know, some like basic educational stuff. Like they will be looking into the origins, but the big surprising factor for me is actually the factor that they will be discussing about race specifically, uh, how the origins of it was around the same time as uh, the days of Martin Luther King Jr. or dur or bas basically during that major civil rights movement where uh, black rights really started to uh, become a mainstream issue, became a, a, a mainstream subject uh, to go and talk about, and how Se how Sesame Street was one of the first uh, show uh, was one of the first TV shows to actually have the balls to actually be progressive, to actually bring in not just black special guest stars, but to actually talk about black rights and how black people should matter. Like th th like Sesame Street, in a way, you could say is one of the first uh, one of the first TV shows to actually say Black Lives Matter. And that is something that still rings true to this day, where you see Sesame Street uh, becoming a proud supporter of Black Lives Matter. Maybe not specifically towards that movement, but you, you can tell that they definitely are on the side of Black Lives Matter, where they are discussing about racism and how to fight against uh, bigotry and hate speech. That they are more on that side, where they are saying racism is wrong and racism should be treated as as a crime. And this is something that we do see that it's not just uh, uh, something that a modern TV show is trying to stay within the current times. This is something that rings true to the tradition of Sesame Street to be not just an educational show, but to also be a progressive show in order to have these new forward thinking ideas in order to make this a better and kinder world as well. And not just looking into the uh, political aspect as well, but also looking into the impact on not, not only affecting television, but how it also affected people as well, both in and out of uh, the show itself, how it impacted people's lives, how people grew up with Sesame Street, and how the people working on the show as well, how they grew up with uh, Sesame Street as well. And honestly, I could already tell just by watching this that this is going to be an extremely 
heartfelt series. Like, th th like, of course, there definitely is a lot of love that's already put onto the Sesame Street series, but I can definitely tell, like, if they are going to talk about the origins of it and with the original cast, especially with people like uh, Jim Henson, uh, Frank Oz, and many more of those people, that's when they're really going to go and um, really get into the heart of of making this and yeah I, I like i can imagine this being a bit of a uh, tear jerker as well but uh, honestly for me I, as someone who is definitely a major jim henson fan and uh, someone who did of course grew up watching sesame street i think honestly this is definitely going to be worth watching this is definitely going to be interesting again i th i think uh it did get some great praise at sundance when it did premiere at the festival uh, so having this come out soon, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how this is going to come out. But definitely something that I do want to keep my eye out, especially if they are going to go more into the origin story of Sesame Street. And especially regarding its impact, uh, not just in our modern culture, but even in terms of the, pol of the politics back then. And the way that its influence is still within us to this day, that Sesame Street, even after 50 years, is still as strong as ever. So honestly, for me, I'm definitely down to go and watch Street Gang. I think this is definitely going to be something for me. I'll have to go and keep my eye out. And for those of you who are interested to see what Street Gang could be all about, then all you have to do is wait until it hits theaters on April 23rd, or if it will come out in your home on demand on May 7th. So, with that said, I would like to now go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask, how do you feel about Street Gang? How do you feel about this trailer of Street Gang? Do you think uh, this is a trailer uh, that convinced you to watch it? Do you guys like what you saw? Did you guys not like what you see? Are you not interested in seeing this movie? Let me know what you all think about this. Okay, let's see. This documentary looks pretty worth watching, actually. Uh, though, when I was a kid, I never watched a whole lot of Sesame Street, but I remember having VHSs of Sesame Street or original shorts of uh, Elmo's World. This movie will be a, a heartfelt moment, and it will touch everyone's hearts, including me. Well, that's definitely nice. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, as a guy who loved Sesame Street as a kid, I would love to see this movie. Quick question. Uh, oh, fudge. Wait a minute. No, get back, get back, get back, get back. <laughs> Wait a minute. Where's my chat wall? I need my chat wall. <laughs> okay, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, where was I? Ah, yes. Do you think this documentary will talk a little bit about the fact that Sesame Street did cross over with the Muppets on several occasions? Or are they not allowed because Sesame Street and Muppets have separate copyright holders? Well, honestly, I'm gonna say no, but not for the reasons you think. I mean, this, like, I, I don't think copyright is really going to be an issue because this is a documentary. And if they are going to present stuff from the Muppet Show or they're going to present Muppet specials that do include Sesame Street characters, they would technically be allowed to do so because it does fall, it, it, it does fall under fair use. That they are using it for educational purposes, thus they are technically allowed to do so without necessarily having the rights uh, of Disney to go and put up those clips onto uh, their documentary. But I I don't know if they would actually highlight any of those Muppet moments uh, that they did cross over with Sesame Street because that would not necessarily be the focus of this documentary in particular. Like, maybe there will be some quick mentions about it, but I don't think they will actually look really into that. It, it, th th this documentary is more about, like, the origins of the making of Sesame Street along with the uh, cultural impact that it had upon its audience and upon the crew that would go and make this series. So honestly, I don't know if they like, yeah, they can, but I don't know if they will. I think that's the best way to answer that question. Uh, let's see what else we got here. 
I already want to see this one. I expect this will be similar in the veins of the uh, Fred Rogers documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor. I'm looking forward to seeing how serious it gets involving the history of the origins of Sesame Street, which I'm sure uh, will be relevant now more than ever. Also, speaking of Defunct Land, uh, one of their most recent episodes talks about the Canadian series Big Comfy Couch and how it included the, CB, uh, the CBC comedy skit from five years ago called Lonette on Creepy Clown. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God. I used to watch Big Comfy Couch, by the way. I mean, I'm Canadian. I'm Canadian. So, of course, as a Canadian who grew up in the 90s, of course, like, Big Comfy Couch was part of, like, the shows that I used to watch. But anyways, um, going back to this, you actually did bring up a very good point regarding Won't You Be My Neighbor. And I think that's going to be the best comparison uh, with this. Like, this is definitely going to be the kind where many people are going to say, if you are a fan of Won't You Be My Neighbor, then you're also going to love Street Gang as well. I think a lot of people will present some strong parallels between those two. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? What other comments? Um, uh, I love Sesame Street as a kid, so this will be an interesting watch. Even if I don't watch a whole lot of documentaries, one aspect I hope they go into is the origins of the spin-offs like Bert and Ernie's Great Adventure. Seriously, those shorts were a lot of fun. But aside from that... This should be a good viewing experience. Yeah, I mean, again, we'll have to wait and see. I don't know what they are going to mention. I don't know what they will reveal. Uh, I don't fully know what they will really dive into specifically in terms of the cultural impact of Sesame Street, but we, we shall see. I mean, I guess the only way to find out is to go and watch uh, Street Gang. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else do we have here? I, I think I'll go and read one more comment before we jump into the next one ah yes okay <clears throat> uh let's see wait chicken soup for the soul is still a thing <laughs> yeah apparently it's still a thing and they have grown to have their own studio who knew <laughs> Uh, in all seriousness, though, as someone who grew up watching Sesame Street, I think this looks interesting, and I think it's worth noting that this is not the first time that Sesame Street has been made into a documentary, as there are also one about Elmo and Big Bird, but aside from that, uh, I'm very interested to watch this when it comes out. Uh, I mean, you are correct. This is not the first Sesame Street documentary specifically, but this is the first one that fully dives into the entirety of Sesame Street. Because like you said, beforehand, those documentaries only looked at those specific characters where you got a uh, big bird and looking into the life of Carol Spinney. And then you got the documentary that goes more into just Elmo. But this one though, this is going to be the big Sesame Street documentary because this is all about the Sesame Street show. So, I think with all that said, uh, again, if you are interested in checking out Street Gang, then all you have to do is just wait until it comes out in theaters on April 23rd or be available on demand on May 7th. All right, so now with that done, it is now time we're going to jump onto our next story. And the next story that we have here, unfortunately, it's going to be a bit of a sad one. And uh, it kind of connects a little bit to what we just talked about with Street Gang, because this will relate to childhood. And what's interesting to note is that this week, there have been a lot of uh, pretty, significant death, uh, pretty significant deaths that has happened, where we did have the recent and surprising passing of DMX, and then there is also the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, Prince Philip, who has died at the age of 99, which, let's be honest, considering that he is the only human being in the world whom the rigor mortis is obviously, uh, that, that already kicked in before he died, I, I think it was a long time coming. I mean, like, th this dude was, uh, like, this dude was obviously about to expire, like, at any point, so of course that was gonna happen. Uh, but, and, and also, um... There is another one that I want to quickly mention in terms of uh, a passing that did happen, and that is actually regarding, um, I'm trying to remember his name, uh, right, it's uh, Ralph Shuckett, uh, who has passed away this week, and this was the guy who was noted to be a composer for many movies and TV shows for four kids. But the one that I'm going to be looking into, however, is going to be someone that, uh, at least for me personally, 
uh, is someone who is very much connected to my childhood. This is someone that, uh, again, like this documentary, you may not know the name, but when you know who it is, you'll immediately recognize this person. And who I'm going to be talking about is, uh, hold on a sec. Yep, there's my mouse. It's going to be Mark Elliott. Yes, Mark Elliott has unfortunately passed away this week at the age of 81. According to this uh, article here on The Hollywood Reporter, it states that in terms of his death, <clears throat> uh, it says here, Elliot died Saturday in a Los Angeles hospital after suffering two heart attacks, friend and fellow voiceover artist Charlie Van Dyke told The Hollywood Reporter. He was also battling lung cancer. He was one of a kind, and kind is a great word to describe him. Now, for those of you who don't know who Mark Elliott is, Mark Elliott is actually a very recognizable uh, commercial voiceover artist. This is a guy who would all, like whose entire career is spent working on uh, on promos and trailers. And on top of that, he was also a very well known uh, DJ uh, DJ radio host, I believe. They said, yeah, uh, a radio DJ. Yeah, he was also a, a well-known radio DJ. And he has done a lot of promos and a lot of trailers throughout his lifetime, uh, working for Fox and CBS, and even were, uh, did, tr did uh, trailers uh, for movies such as Chariots of Fire, Smokey and the Bandit, The Goodbye, Girls, uh, the Goodbye Girl, and Star Wars. But what he is the most recognized for is regarding his work that he has done for Disney. If you have grown up uh, listening to a lot of Disney VHSs and Disney DVDs, then there's a very good chance that you are very familiar with his voice, where he has actually provided uh, the voice of the grand majority of Disney trailers that came out between 1983 and 2008. Uh, there's even a little excerpt here uh, that did actually describe his career with Disney, where it says here, in 1977, Disney's in-house trailer producer Craig Murray hired Elliot to provide the voiceover for Disney's theatrical re-release of Cinderella, beginning an association that would last well into the 2000s, uh, defining his career and cast him as the voice of the company for many millions of children and their parents alike. He would voice theatrical trailers, provide narration for the anthology series The Magical World of Disney, and provide voiceovers for previews and bumpers on home entertainment releases. His voice indelibly is linked with the phrase, And now, our feature presentation, and experience the magic. We also got a quote from him in the past where he said, you think about decisions that were made and paths that were chosen and all those sorts of things. And working for Disney for me is the defining moment in my life. Not just my career, but in my life. Because it did, uh, because it did, it, uh, because it did is giving, it, it gives me this identity which continues to this day. He also added that being the voice of Disney is a wonderful touchstone for my career. If that's the identity that I carry with me for the rest of my life, I wouldn't have it any other way. And even quickly mentioned as well that on top of the different movies that he has done, he was also known as uh, the voice of uh, all the trailers for the Muppet movies. Uh, whenever there would be a Muppet movie that would come out back in like the 90s and the early 2000s, then he would be the one to immediately jump in and provide the voice for those trailers. And um, if you're still not familiar, if that still does not ring a bell, then you know what? I actually do have a trailer here uh, that we can go and quickly listen to. And I think this is a perfect example of the kind of voice that um, that that um, uh, Mark Elliott has throughout the Disney trailer. So here's one that I have. This is uh, back in 1994 for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So let's have a quick listen. I it's your favorite Disney movie of all time. It's the one you've been waiting for. I hope, I hope. And now it's finally coming to home video. I hope, I hope. Walt Disney's masterpiece, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Hooray! It's the classic story of a beautiful princess. Who is the fairest one of all? 
Snow White. Snow White. The evil queen who would stop at nothing to destroy her. Poison apple. Have a bite. Then I'll be perished in the land. The queen, Snow White. And the seven dwarfs who came to the rescue. We gotta save her. <laughs> It's the first time on video for Snow White, Sleepy, Doc, Bashful, Happy, Grumpy, <laughs> Dopey, and <laughs> Sneezy. <laughs> now you can experience all the magic, mush, and all the fun of the greatest animated motion picture of all time. Walt Disney's timeless classic, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, coming to video cassette for a very limited time. Don't miss your chance to share Disney's masterpiece with your family. May I just add that there is something a little bit funny with this trailer, that it is so stupidly obvious when there would be a re-recording done, like back in 1994. Like, you, you could tell which lines were from the movie, and then there's also, like, the lines that were from, like, that, that were purposely re-recorded for this trailer. And some of them don't even sound like it. Like, um, like one, one great example is with the, uh, with the evil queen when she's turned into the witch. Like, just, just have a quick listen. Have a bite. Man, I... Like, you hear that a little bit, and it's like, the poison apple, have a bite, that I'll be, and it's like, wait, what the fridge? And also, with this trailer, oh my god, it keeps bothering me so much, for, I don't know if this is because of this video specifically, but it's like, there was this one point where they, just, where it's like, out of nowhere, like, this random line comes in, it feels so out of place, like, just have a quick listen. Magic, mush, and all the fun. You hear that, right? Just like that one random th that that one random line there. Now you can experience all the magic, mush, and all the fun. <laughs> like I was just there, like, well, like I was looking through my tabs, like, is there a video that's playing? Like, why was there this random moment that's like mush? It was like. Who said that? <laughs> it, was just, it just feels so random and out of place. Oh, but anyways, um, all jokes aside, though, you guys pretty much got the idea of who Mark Elliot his, uh, who Mark Elliot is, and yes, it is indeed that guy. And you can definitely, and like even from this trailer, you could definitely hear like the kind of voice, how it is so tied with Disney, how this is considered to be the Disney voice, like very upbeat, but very grandiose at the same time. Like th this really does sound like from, uh, from an authoritative figure, but a very kind hearted authoritative figure. Like this is someone, uh, who like who values the most, uh, uh, about having fun, about giving people a good time. Like, this is a, a positive voice. Like, this definitely does sound like the voice of Disney. Like if, like, if Walt Disney did not have his voice like he had back in the day, like, this would probably be it. And it's not only to... to <coughs> Fudge Nabbit, stupid spit, uh, getting in the throat at the wrong time. But anyways, uh, but... With that kind of voice, it's not just for, like, this upbeat and fun time kind of thing. It is also used for another side of Disney that is more, um, how can I put this? Majestic. That really emphasizes the magic of Disney. And, and there is another trailer that I want to show you. This is one that I keep share that, that I saw that kept on sharing on social media related to the news of the passing of Mark Elliott. Um, it's actually this trailer here of Cinderella. Let's have a listen to this one now. It's going to play. Don't worry. Hey, give it time. You are the only ladies of the household, I hope, I presume... Hi, There's no one voice. else, Your Grace. Your Grace! Your Grace! Please, wait! The beauty. The romance. 
the magic. Disney's most magical fairy tale. On the stroke of 12, the spell will be broken. Digitally restored to its original brilliance. Salakadoola, Menchikaboola, put them together, and what have you got? bibbidi bobbidi boo it's like a wonderful dream come true. Available for the first time in 10 years. Critics say Cinderella is a sheer joy. It's even better than you remember it. Cinderella Special Edition. Now on Disney DVD and Video. I just gotta say... That was a beautiful trailer right here. Like, that was very well crafted. And even I got so invested. I want to know, like, what is this song, by the way? Like, what? Like what is that soundtrack? Like, that was freaking amazing. Like, I don't know if it was made exclusively for this, but if there's a way to find it online, I would love to have it. Like, let's have another listen. The beauty. The romance. Oh my god, that is amazing. I want I want to hear I, I want this soundtrack seriously. That is just incredible. But again, you can hear this other side of uh Mark Elliott here. Something that is um, you know, th like l less like he toned down a bit of the fun in order to emphasize the beauty of it. And that, you know, and real like he really knows how to sell these movies very well in order to really capture the tone of these uh, family features and really get into like what they are all about. And that like, like he, he, like when, when, when Mark Elliott would try to go and sell you something, he really does make it feel like you're going to be in not just for a good time, but you're going to be in for something that is absolutely incredible. Like you, you could see there is a bit of a contrast, but you can hear like they are both very effective in the same way. And that really is the power of Mark Elliott. And for me personally, I, I, as you could probably imagine, as a kid who grew up all about Disney, of course, um, uh, like I had a whole bunch of Disney VHSs. So you could probably imagine almost on a daily basis, I get to, or like mo maybe more on a weekly basis, but almost on a daily basis. I would hear this guy's voice when before they would go and start the movie where he would go and tell you about the next big thing that's coming out either in theaters or on Disney VHS and DVD. Like he he was a Disney staple and uh, like depending on how much those DVDs and VHSs were a part of your life, then Mark Elliott was definitely a part of that, uh, like a part of your life as well, where it's impossible where nowadays it would be hard to imagine a Disney trailer without hearing that Mark Elliott style voice. Like he, like in a way he would definitely be marketed as the voice of Disney, that he is the voice of the Walt Disney Company. And whenever they, they would go and advertise something, then they would definitely use someone like Mark Elliott. Yeah, he didn't do all the uh, Disney movies, but generally, if they would have a voice to go and promote the next big Disney film, they would immediately go and get someone like Mark Elliott, or specifically, get Mark Elliott. But uh, I did mention, however, that in 2008, that's when he would stop uh, doing these uh, voices. And you might be wondering, like, is it because Mark Elliott retired or, or something like that? Well, at that point, there isn't really much of a confirmation, but I do have a little bit of a theory about why Disney stopped using uh, Mark Elliott's voice for the trailers. And it's not necessarily because of his fault, uh, but it's mostly because of the landscape of trailers where it really changed after 2008. And the reason why I say this is because of the death of Don LaFontaine. And by the way, if you don't know who Don LaFontaine is, he is the most recognized voice trailer, uh, a trailer voice of all time. We are literally talking about the guy that has the 
in a world voice. Like, you you know, I think you all know that that guy. Like, even if you haven't grown up listening to those types of in a world trailers, like, you know specifically what is that in a world voice. Like, like you would watch a trailer and he would come in to say, in a world where man versus where man is constantly fighting against nature. Only one guy is able to go and save the planet. Weird Al Yankovic and his magical speedos. <laughs> you know, something like that, per se. And, uh, but, but, unfortunately, he did pass away in 2008, and immediately afterwards, that's when you start to notice that trailers uh, decided to go and have this immediate shift, where they are less dependent on narrators, and they would just solely rely on clips in order to go and sell the movie, or they would have, like, a bunch of writing that will pop up and be in your face to go and describe the movie. It's like, coming this summer, you're about to enter in the world of Speedos or something like that. I don't know why I'm using an example of Weird Al Yankovic and Speedos. I don't know if that's a if that's a pleasant image or something like that. But then again, I can imagine Weird Al can find a way to actually make that fun. Uh, but anyways... Um, you, you you get what I mean though the the landscape of how they would go or the the the, the whole structure of how they would build trailers completely changed and even Disney picked up on it and unfortunately that's when they would have to go and let go of Mark Elliott which is a true shame because as someone who did grew up in the 90s who grew up in with so many of these DVDs and VHSs honestly I would have loved to hear his voice one more time like, bring him back for, like, one more trailer or something like that. Just, you know, just to really bring back that magic. And it would have been great. You know, it would have been such a great time, especially nowadays when, um, they're, like, when capitalizing on nostalgia has become such a massive market. It would have been great to hear him voice one more time for, like, one trailer project or something like that. In fact, actually, there is uh, something that... Um, I do want to share. There is something that I did, like something that I did plan a while ago, but it never came to fruition. You know, honestly, originally, uh, I actually did think I wanted to try to make a trailer for Animation Look Back, Walt Disney Animation Studios Plus, and I wanted to hire Mark Elliott to work on the project. However, when trying to do research and trying to find contacts on how to bring him on board. It ended up becoming a lot more complicated than I thought, and also probably a little too expensive as well, because at the end of the day, Mark Elliott is still a union actor, so from there, that's why you gotta go through all these contracts, you gotta go through all these different, like, hurdles and obstacles and, like, a massive, like, price tag as well, and, like, I'm just sitting here thinking, like, I just wanna make a trailer for my YouTube series, I don't think I, I don't think I can really handle this responsibility so ultimately I did bail out on the project so uh, that, that was just one little tidbit that I wanted to share it doesn't really matter anyways I already finished the series already but it was just one crazy I idea that I had in mind but you know honestly for me I will say though overall with um with what happened with Mark Elliott it's it, it really is unfortunate it really is sad to see him go I, again this is someone that I grew up listening to so many times uh, de like his voice is incomparable. Like it's very much iconic. And, um, even though we're not going to hear him again, I, I do wish that Disney would bring back that format. You know, I honestly, I would like to, I, I would like to hear trailers, uh, have narrators again. That would definitely be awesome. And for Disney to, you know, if they, if they could find a successor to Mark Elliott, that would definitely be awesome. But it's honestly really sad to see him go and may Mark Elliott rest in peace. And, you know, and I just want to say thank you for being a part of my childhood. I mean, like, yeah, you were just there for the trailers, but I mean, th those trailers would not be the same without you. Just want to go and say that. So with that said right now, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask, what do you all think about this? Uh, how do you, like, um, do you have any words that you would like to say about Mark Elliott? Or, or are, are there any uh, memories that you would like to share regarding uh, the trailers of Mark Elliott, rather they be from Disney or not? Let me know what you think. Uh, 
Uh, let's see what we got here. Hold on a sec. Mark Elliott was one of the voices that you always recognize, even if you never heard of his name. He's the textbook definition of the term voice of a generation, and as such, will definitely be missed. I do have one question regarding the dude. Was he the voice you hear on Walt Disney World's tram that's all, for your safety, remain seated with the doors closed? Or is that some uh, someone else? Um, actually, I think that was someone else. Um, let me double check, actually. Uh, that is a good question. Um, hold on. Uh, Disney voice Walt Disney World tram. Uh, yeah, I do believe that is um, someone else that they brought on board. Uh, just want to just want to double check because uh, I, I want to be sure. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, like I, I have an article here. In, in fact, you, you know what? L l let's go and search this uh, together. Unless the the chat wall already figured out who it is, but um, no, I, I'm sure it's a different voice. But um, I just want to be sure. I I, I want to know myself who is that name. Actually, um, hold on a sec. Uh, well, beforehand, get the, could you oh, son of a fish? Only subscribers log in. Uh, hold on a sec. Okay, let me let me just get back into this. Uh, let's see now. It says, um, yeah, uh, okay, it's a uh, Hirsch. Yeah, okay, they say it's uh, okay. Let's see Hirsch, but I just want to see. Oh yes, um, or oh yeah, Joe Hir. I believe it's Joe Hirsch. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, Joe Hirsch. It's that. Yeah. 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 That guy who you're thinking about is, uh, Joe Hirsch. I believe that's his name. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. Maybe, um, may, maybe I, I could be wrong. Oh, and there's even at one point Tom Kane actually did the voice as well, but yeah, who you're thinking about is, uh, Joe Hirsch. So I just want to go and, uh, emphasize that so finally we did we did get we we did solve the mystery on that sorry it took a little while but but it was something that i was very curious um uh <laughs> curious myself uh let's see now uh it is sad that this well-known voice is gone i remember hearing him through the trailers on my toy story 2 vhs and he even did the teaser trailer for jonah a veggie tales movie which i'm surprised he did that as well as him saying coming soon to theaters and coming soon to own on video and dvd yeah, that is true. He also did that. And honestly, I'd much rather like the soother ver like in terms of those ones, I'd much rather the ones that were on DVD. Like you know the ones that are like do do you know with that little tune? Like I remember there was that one that came like on uh on the DVDs and stuff like that. I much prefer those ones because I remember like back in the 90s like on the VHSs, I remember they they had what I call like the explosion banners. You probably I'm not I'm not going to show it because it'll it'll pop up some like PTSD crap. But you probably know the, those ones. You can look it up yourself. It's the ones where like somehow it sounds like a like the best way to describe it is like a missile coming in and it lands right next to your ear and just freaking makes a loud explosion like it just goes in like boom, bang! And it's like Jesus, Bob, what the frick happened and it's like oh no it's just a title just just saying coming soon to own on video cassette it's like what the frick it's like excuse me can, can i get some time to breathe on that seriously i am surprised not many people would talk about it or they don't want to talk about it but you know exactly what i'm talking about yeah okay some people are bringing up thx okay to be fair with thx they build up to the loud noise like they brace yourself for it with those explosive banners no they just go straight to it like they're just coming in oh that's a nice trailer okay Oh, that's fun. Oh, maybe I'll consider watching The Lion King. All right, let's see what's next. Bang! Gee, oh, what the fridge? <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, no, it's just, okay, no, no, it's just preparing ourselves for the next trailer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I just thought I would just go and mention that. It's like a small, weird thing, but I remember in my childhood, it was something that always freaked me out. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, anyways, um... 
this is really unfortunate, and uh, as I had loved the uh, Disney VHSs growing up, also I'm pretty sure that Mark Elliott was the guy who did the voice of the Disney Fast Play, but other than that, I do have one question. D did uh, Mark Elliott also do commercials for the Disney Parks, or was it mostly just trailers? Um, I don't know about the Disney Parks, maybe, but um, yes, he definitely was the guy who did Disney Fast Play. That I, I, I do remember. Uh, let's see. To be honest, I never figured out who uh, who was he after all this time until his death. No, seriously, I used to watch many Disney films on VHSs and DVDs throughout the 2000s as a kid, and I never figured out who the voiceover was. Now that I know, I'm very sad that he passed away. He was one of the best up there, uh, along with Tom Kane, in doing voiceovers, in trailers, and in commercials, and I would have loved to get an autograph from him uh, if he was alive right now. Hope he rests in peace, and I hope he had a great life. Yeah, honestly, it's the same with me. It wasn't until, like, just uh, a couple of years ago that I just discovered who he was. Like, for a while, I always knew who that guy was, but I never knew his name. It wasn't until I made one post on social media about it, and and uh, some people were bringing up his name, and it was indeed Mark Elliott. So I was like, oh, finally. I, I felt like it was, like, years of a mystery that was finally solved in my head. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh... Oh, yeah. I honestly did not know who Mark Elliott was before this. I didn't realize that this was the same man who did the voice for Disney VHSs and DVD releases. I've only seen a few, a few of these trailers, but after hearing his voice, it truly is Disney magic. All I can say is, rest in peace, Mark Elliott, and may your legacy will live on forever. Oh, that's very nice. Uh, let's see. Here's another uh, uh, interesting fact that I found out about him. Mark Elliott guest hosted a few radio shows starring Casey Kasem, uh, such as America's Top 40 and Casey's Top 40. Uh, and as I said before, Mark Elliott is like Don LaFontaine of the Disney movie trailers. Seeing a lot of Disney trailers myself, I always miss that voice. And he'll be among the many legends of voiceover of the voiceover industry, animated or not. Oh, definitely, man. Yeah, trust me. Like, the... Like, trail like honestly like voiceover tra like trailer voiceovers they're very underrated and i would love you know i, I want to see that format come back you know they they could be quite effective if done right so like they they could even sell you like garbage movies and make it sound pretty epic so that that would be something i wish to see come back if, if at the very least like to see who would be the next mark elliott that would also be great all right, I'll go and read one more comment uh, that we would have over here. Mark Re uh, Mark uh, had had a rare voice that was calm, uh, calming, inviting, friendly, and fun to listen to. Uh, ever since I was born, Mark's voice was always been a part of my childhood. Similarly to how uh, Roger Parsons is to Pokemon for being uh, its longtime narrator, Mark Elliott was the unmistakable voice of Disney in general. May he rest in peace, and in his honor, could you please play this link I included? This was his most famous catchphrase. Uh, where is it? Okay. Alright, so you want to cap this off on uh, a catchphrase? Alright. Uh, let's see here. Oh, the feature presentation thing. Now, our feature presentation. Well, I mean, we're already at uh, part four on this. I mean... We, we were long into our feature presentation. Actually, hold on. Let me go and redo that, actually. You need to see that. You, you got to see this, actually. And now, our feature presentation. Thank you. But, again, this is the feature presentation. We, we're long into... We're, like, more than halfway into the feature presentation. So, yeah, a, a, bit, a bit late on that, uh, Mark. But, yeah. Um, may Mark rest in peace. And, um, hold, like... One day, hopefully, we will have a successor to Mark. I'll, I'll definitely miss his voice for sure. All right. It is now time that we shall jump onto the grand finale of it all. And with this grand finale, I want to bring you back to last week. Because as you may recall, uh, last week was Easter. And I'm sure this was a holiday that many people celebrated in their own little ways. Uh, they would have a little family reunion. Uh, they would go on an Easter egg hunt. Or, what is most likely the case, eat a buttload of candy. Like, that was definitely a time that 
People would use Easter as an excuse to just gobble up on all the chocolates, on all the marshmallows, and all the candy that they could possibly have. And I'm going to be very honest with you all. Last week, I might have indulged a little bit, and that could be the reason why I may have gained two pounds. <laughs> oh, yes. But um, anyways, with that said, yes, I am very guilty of eating a buttload of candy sometimes. I have a massive sweet tooth. But one thing I would like to ask to you all, has it ever happened to you that you would go and pick up one of your um, one of your Easter egg candies, whether it be chocolates or whatever, have you ever picked it up and looked at it? And have you ever thought to yourself, you know what? You know this thing right here, this candy? It would actually make a pretty epic movie. Like this candy right over here. I could actually see this turn into a major motion fe feature. Well, I know what you're probably thinking. You, you might look at me and think, well, Matt, that is freaking stupid. Are you absolutely insane? Because that is one of the dumbest things, or possibly the dumbest thing, that you have said in this podcast so far. Maybe. But as it turns out, there was actually someone who actually did have that mentality. Who actually did think of that. And because of this, this is why we, we are going to have a Peeps movie. Yes... A company by the name of Wonder Street has now gotten the rights to the Peeps Marshmallow brand in order to turn that into an animated feature. And so far, we don't really have any information. Like, this is very early in the works. And uh, so far, the only ones that we have, uh, the only people that are going to be working on it so far are the people uh, that are attached to Wonder Street, which is uh, Christine and Mark Holder, uh, along with uh, writer David Goldblum, who's going to be writing this uh, movie and is going to be a producer as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know what this movie will be about, uh, this is going. I'm just going to read you my from my source here on Deadline, as it states: Deadline has learned that Wonder Street has acquired the film TV rights to the Marshmallow Candies, uh, with the featured bill as being the spirit of trolls meets Smurfs. It will follow a ragtag group of peep characters who set out on a cross-country journey in order to attend Peeps Fest, an annual brand celebration in Pennsylvania. And of course, also mentioning uh, David Goldblum and stuff. Now, we also got a, a quote here coming from the uh, Director of Marketing and Consumer Engagement of Just Born, the company that would make those Peep Marshmallows, uh, Keith, uh, Keith uh, Domolewski, to which he states, Peeps, Chicks, and Bunnies have been integrated in American pop culture for nearly seven decades due to their instantly recognizable shapes and fan-favorite marshmallow tastes, making them the perfect characters to bring to life on the big screen. Because if there is anything that would make the... Qu if there is anything that you would have to look in order to find the perfect qualification in order to make a feature film, it's of course by the shape and by the taste of a thing. Of course, those are the two big factors. What, like, you gotta look at, like, what, what, what can you find in order to make uh, a great movie? What would be the great basis of a movie? Go and find a thing, look at the shape of it, and see how it tastes. That's your idea. Of th that's the big plan of how to find the perfect inspiration for a movie. Of course. Anyways, uh, Keith would go on by saying... We hope the new Peeps film spreads sweetness to families across the country and provide inspiration for fans to express their Peepsonality in new ways. Oof, man. <laughs> their Peepsonality. I can't even say it regularly. Like, that can't even be considered a pun. That's like, um, that, that, that's like something that you really, that, that, that's like a stretch. That's like something you really gotta, like, you really gotta dig deep in order to make, like, a, a pun, like, like, in order to make some kind of pun. You know, I can't even say that completely. It's like, it, it's like, it's like hard to really bring it out. Your peepsonality. My god, hopefully they're not gonna go and make a big trend out of it, you know? They're, they're not gonna go and, like, you know, you're not gonna see taglines of, like, unleash your peepsonality. Oh, god. 
<laughs> like seriously, th- th- maybe that is like one of the dumbest things you will hear in this podcast. Like to let out your peepsonality. Yeah, unleash your, unleash your personality that is similar to freaking like over sugarized marshmallows, which they're already freaking sugar as it is. Oh my god, but. Just to give you a little bit of context, by the way, uh, regarding Wonder Street, they're actually doing pretty strongly so far, especially with their new movie, which is called the Ma- uh, the Mauritanian. Uh, to which right now is actually getting a lot of uh, a lot of attention uh, during this year's award season, including getting a couple of nominations at the Golden Globes and even getting several at the uh, BAFTAs. Uh, most namely regarding uh, the actors that would play in there, including Jodie Foster and um, uh, Tahar Rahim. In fact, I, I think it even states here that uh, Jodie Foster actually did win for the Mar- uh, for the Mauritanian uh, for uh, win a Golden Globe for her performance in that movie. So this is just to give you a, a big idea of who the company is. But with that said, of course, we're getting a Peeps movie. It's 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 a Peeps movie. <laughs> Somehow, you y- y- get marshmallows. And that somehow is going to become a a Peeps movie. Somehow you could see this and you could see how you can make some kind of movie that's similar to Trolls or Smurfs and, yeah, somehow build a giant franchise out of it. Like, somehow it's not enough for Peeps this year to go and make a Pepsi. Now you want to go and make a movie. So you want to enjoy your Peeps movie with your Peeps Pepsi and your Peeps popcorn and just just indulge yourself in sugar. Where, like, not even halfway through the movie, you'll immediately die of diabetes right there. Like, immediately, you'll just indulge yourself in so much sugar, death is gonna appear in front of you, and he'll take off his cloak, and it'll reveal its wolf... It'll be Wilford Brimley. <laughs> he'll just look at you going, You got too much diabetes in you. Come on over. Let's go. <laughs> But yeah, apparently th- this is what they're going to do. A freaking Peeps movie. And honestly, my reaction to this is just, of course. You know, at this rate, why the fridge not? I mean, we're pretty much making animated films based on anything right now. So why not go and actually make some kind of Peeps movie? And again, like this is not all and this is not to always slam it. I mean, I do understand there is that chance that they could actually take this and they could turn that into a decent feature. There is that possibility that they could do so. And I'll be open minded uh, to to see if that could actually be the case. But then again, I feel like there is still that 99% chance that this Peeps movie is going to be as entirely stupid as it sounds. Because at the end of the day, you're turning, you're taking marshmallow candies and you're turning that into a feature film. That somehow marshmallows is the basis, it's the concept of your feature film. Again, there is that small chance That it could turn out to be good. It could turn out to be a pleasant surprise in the veins of the Lego movie. But as it is right now, no. It just sounds absolutely stupid. And I mean, at this rate, like I said before, I'm just not surprised anymore of the fact that, of course, they would go and make something like this. As stupid as it sounds, of course they would go and immediately go and make a movie that sounds like its concept seems so desperate, like freaking Peeps Marshmallows. And the reason why I say this is because nowadays, I just feel completely nullified over, like, these stupid concepts, you know? Like, we've heard so many of these dumb ideas for an animated feature to the point where I feel like you know what, whatever, I just, you know, I'm no longer phased over hearing the, uh, the, like, what kind of crazy concept that they would actually create, uh, based on, just, just in, in order to go and turn it into an animated feature, and, uh, I've already seen, I'm already seeing some people in the chat wall actually bringing it up, but for me, honestly, for, for me, it has to be the Emoji Movie, it really is because of the Emoji Movie, Where I feel like I'm no longer phased anymore. Because let's face it, with the Emoji Movie, we have already made it into the bottom of the barrel in terms of ideas 
for a, a family friendly animated feature film. You cannot go any lower than the Emoji Movie, or maybe you can, but you're gonna end up going into some dark and very dangerous territories. But in terms of like these uh, Hollywood style family friendly animated features, that's it. Like you pretty much make it all the way down to the Emoji Movie. And ever since then, We've already heard so many other concepts that are pretty much in the veins of the Emoji Movie and because of that one right there, it's hard to really be shocked about anything else where they would be like such stupid ideas, but we're at the point where of course Hollywood would go and try to make this kind of idea. Like we've already went through that like with uh, the Playmobil movie and even just recently with uh, the Bobbleheads movie. Like that's another one that, that existed of course. And so, hearing something like a Peeps movie, of course it's going to happen. It's like, yeah, like, why not? If you're going to make a movie, like, if you're really going to be at the point where you're just going to make movies based on anything, then yeah, why not? Just bring in Peeps. Let's let's just see what happens. Okay, fine. And again, like, and again, like, I'll be open-minded to see if maybe they could actually figure out a pretty solid idea on how to turn this into something that can be entertaining. And so far, they like the most that we do have is regarding the plot line where it's going to be like this uh, Trolls meets Smurfs-like crossover. Now, I don't know necessarily what they mean by Smurfs per se. I don't know if they mean specifically like uh, the Sony Pictures animation movies or if they mean like the Hanna-Barbera cartoons or they mean specifically like the Payo comics. I don't know, but like maybe like if if they can figure it out, like if they're capable of actually finding a creative concept and actually make a Peeps movie be appealing and actually go and work out, then maybe it, it may maybe it could be worth it. Maybe it could be something that that could exceed expectations and actually become enjoyable. Who knows? But then again, but but then again, it does seem like this is something that we are starting to see more often and yeah trolls is becoming like the next uh, it's becoming like the next lego movie in a way where it's influencing others to try to make their own versions of trolls per se look we've already seen this happen before where we got um uh, not too long like a couple of years ago there was uh, the ugly dolls movie that was released and that film was like, like it was almost, uh, I, I could actually say it was almost shameless in the way that it tries so hard to be like uh, Trolls. That it wants to try to capitalize on the Trolls' success, but of course to no avail. So in terms of Peeps Marshmallows, like the fact that they're doing the same thing and it's obvious, like it, it, it sounds like their motive is literally try to make their version of Trolls. I don't, I don't know if it's really going to work out. For me, honestly, what I'm expecting, like, maybe it might not end up becoming the worst. It might not be, like, as bad as the Emoji Movie. But I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm just hoping that if it does get released and if it would get released in theaters, then hopefully it won't be as bad. It won't, like, be horrendous and intolerable to watch. Like, make sure, though, like, if, if, if this thing is guaranteed to blow, then let, let's hope that they, they'll find a way to soften the blow. They'll actually have some good animation, they'll have some decent songs, or they'll have some actors that can deliver some solid performances. Like, that, that that's what happened with, uh, that, that's what happened with, uh, with Ugly Dolls. I mean, that movie, I, I, I personally feel like that movie is garbage, but there are some good things about it. Like, it has some solid animation, and I was actually surprised to find that Nick Jonas was actually really good in that movie. Like, he was probably, uh, the best actor in there, bar none. Uh, but other than that, though, honestly looking at this, with, with Peeps, yeah. It's a really stupid film, but I mean, at this rate, in this post-emoji movie animation, uh, like, in, in, in these post-emoji movie times, are we really that surprised that they would go and make an animated feature based on peeps? So, honestly, I'm not, and honestly, I'm just hope, like, I, I just feel like there's a very solid chance that it's gonna be bad, but what I am hoping for is that it won't be that bad. I think that's the best way to go and put it. 
All right, so with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and I would like to go and ask you all, how do you feel about a Peeps movie? Do you think that there is a chance that it could turn out to be good? It could turn out to be an enjoyable feature? Do you think this could end up becoming as bad or almost as bad as the Emoji movie? Let me know what you all think. Uh, let's see now. I've never been a fan of peeps as I find them way too bitter for me, but I'm mixed on this and it could either end up becoming incredibly stupid in the veins of something like bobbleheads or the emoji movie, or it could end up becoming a pleasant surprise. I think this is something where we're just going to have to wait and see and as to how it turns out. By the way, Flaming Hot Cheetos is also getting a live action movie in the style of the founder, which I think could be interesting. Okay, now that Flaming Hot Cheetos movie... That makes sense. That I'm on board on it because it's not a movie about, fl you know, uh, it's not a movie about cartoon Cheetos coming to life or whatever. That is actually a story or, or that, that from what I've heard, that is actually a true story about how Flaming Hot Cheetos were created. How a janitor uh, somehow made these Flaming Hot Cheetos and became a massive success and helped grow the Cheetos brand. Like, that was actually, that is actually inter something interesting. That is something that I would be on board to actually see. But this Peeps movie, no. This is like full on trying to be like trolls, trying to be like Smurfs. Like, try to literally bring these Peeps move, bring, bring these marshmallows to life. Uh, let's see what we got here. I'm not too surprised at this news. With me having gotten so uh, so accustomed to hearing about Hollywood's classic shenanigans that's just that range from all across the scale of corporate bat crap insanity, after the Emoji Movie, it's all white noise. Certainly not after we got something like the Animal Crackers Movie. Uh, what I am surprised doesn't exist is already is an M&M's movie, given how the brand already has established and have recognizable characters in its commercials. Okay, well, to be fair with Animal Crackers, like, yeah, that sounds completely stupid, but uh, at the most, I will say that the filmmakers, they did make the most out of it. You know, like, it's not a great movie, but, you know, it's, eh. You know, I would say it's, like, it's mediocre at worst and decent at best. At least they were capable of finding a way to make Animal Crackers creative in their movie. At least they had some kind of idea. So, like, I, I just want to go and uh, uh, go a little bit on the defense of Animal Crackers. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Why am I not surprised a Peeps movie is going to be a thing? At this point, Hollywood has truly reached the bottom of the barrel, and I am not shocked at what Hollywood can do anymore. Seriously. Uh, it makes me wish we live in an opposite universe where the Emoji movie was never made and this trend never happened. Yeah, so, yeah, it was just, uh, Sony Animation was going through, uh, a pretty tough time back then. Like, it, like, they, they, like, the reason why the Emoji Movie exists, or part of the reason why, is because Sony Pictures was in an act of desperation after, like, after the events of the, uh, Sony hack. If you guys remember back at the end of, uh, 2014 when that insanity occurred. <laughs> so, that, that, that's the thing. Maybe there would have been a world where... The Emoji Movie would never happen, but I am glad to say that, like, Sony Animation is in a position right now where they are much better than where they used to be, or they they were much better than they're they're much better than ever. And nowadays, they most likely would never go and pick up something like the Emoji Movie. Uh, let's see. We already got a movie based on emojis, Playmobil, ugly dolls, and even bobbleheads, so that just feels pa uh, partially inoffensive. They might give us some interesting backgrounds or designs based around candy like Sugar Rush and Wreck-It Ralph, but that's the only good thing I could think about. Besides, that just sounds like a waste of time and money. Yeah, I know, man. <laughs> it's just, with this Peeps movie, hopefully they will find ways to actually be creative with Peeps. But other than that, though, it's just, so far, you're not really impressing us with your, con with your concept. Uh, let's see. While having more family Easter movies besides Illumination's Hop is nice, this is not it. It sounds like it will be a long advertisement for, for Peeps. 
It might be colorful looking, but I don't think the writing will be anything special. I hope uh, I, I hope to be wrong, though. I wonder if this will be released in theaters or on DVD, and what studio will release it for Wonder Street, because STX had two animated bombs uh, already based on the products with both Ugly Dolls and Playmobil. Now, I will say the only defense that I could ever say about Peeps is, like, technically the criticisms that people would have now regarding that movie. You could technically say the same thing about the Lego movie. But then again, that could be, like, a straw man excuse to just defend the, the feature. I know it's a straw man defense. Uh, but then again, like, ultimately, we never know how this is going to be. But, yeah, it's not leaving a good impression with its concept. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, so I think I'll go and read, uh, I don't know if I said this already, but anyways, I'll go and read one more comment before we go. I'm not too surprised at this news with me having gotten so accustomed to hearing about Hollywood's classic shenanigans that just range from all across the scale. Of, oh, no, wait, no, I've already read that one, sorry. Ah, there we go. Uh, I'm having my fingers crossed while waiting until the Rotten Tomato score for the Peeps movie is revealed. It's nice to see that we're getting more Easter movies. Illuminations Hop is one of them. But you know, your movie is bad when even, even Bullwinkle J. Moose has better puns than words like peepsonality. Uh, Wonder Street, where, where did you go wrong? <laughs> yeah, just immediately like being a highlight. Yeah, like how did Wonder Street go from being an award season darling to trying to make a peeps movie? I don't know. It's, it's just a strange mystery. And with that said, I think that shall conclude this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. What a fun adventure that we have been, and I'm glad that we are back on our regularly scheduled program with this. Tune in next week for more crazy news that are going to be happening, and I think some big ones will actually be coming out next week, so uh, keep your eyes out for that. And with all that said, I would like to say thank you all so much for listening, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time... See you later, dudes!